Hello, and welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Authors series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore ampersand books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so happy to have Tony Jensen with us today. First, we'll hear her read and then we'll talk. Tony Jensen teaches in the MFA program at the University of Arkansas and the Institute of American Indian Arts. She is a 2020 recipient of a Creative Writing Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, and her work has been published in Orion, Catapult, and Ecotone. She is Mati. Tony Jensen grew up around guns. As a girl, she learned to shoot birds in rural Iowa with her father, a card-carrying member of the NRA. As an adult, she's had guns waved in her face near Standing Rock and felt their silent threat on the concealed carry campus where she teaches. And she has always known that in this, she is not alone. As a Mati woman, she is no stranger to the violence enacted on the bodies of indigenous women on indigenous land and the ways it is hidden, ignored, and forgotten. In her book, Carrie, a, memor a memoir of survival on stolen land, Jensen maps her personal experience onto the historical, exploring how history is lived in the body and redefining the language we use to speak about violence in America. In prose at once forensic and deeply emotional, Toni Jensen shows herself to be a brave new voice and a fearless witness to her own difficult history, as well as to the violent cultural landscape in which she finds her coordinates. Toni Jensen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to all of you for, for coming out virtually, I guess, tonight. Um, yeah, I never know exactly how to put that, but thank you for being here. How about that? I am going to read um, from the first chapter in the book from Women in the Fracklands because it's, um, I think, an essay that fits in with the taking care of the land of our fellow citizens, uh, fellow people in our neighborhoods and our communities, um, but especially taking care of the land. So this is chapter one, Women in the Fracklands. One, on Magpie Road, the colors are in riot, sharp blue sky over green and yellow tall grass that rises and falls like water in the North Dakota wind. Magpie Road holds no magpies, only robins and crows. A group of magpies is called a tiding, a gulp, a murder, a charm. When the men in the pickup make their first pass there on the road, you are photographing the grass against sky, an ordinary bird blurring over a lone rock formation. You do not photograph the men, but if you had, you might have titled it Father and Son Go Hunting. They wear camouflage and their mouths move in animation or argument. They have their windows down as you have left those in your own car down the road. It is warm for fall, it's grass season and maybe partridge, but not yet waterfowl. Despite how partridge are in the lexicon vis-a-vis -vis pear trees and holiday singing, the birds actually make their homes on the ground. You know which birds are in season because you are from Iowa, another rural place where guns and men and shooting seasons are part of the knowledge considered common. Marian Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defined in season in relation to timing, levels of fitness, and whether a thing is legally available to be hunted or caught. The first use of off season comes in 1847. Definitions include a time of suspended or reduced activity, especially the time during which an athlete is not training or competing, a period of time when travel to a particular place is less popular and prices are lower, or sports, a period of time when official games, tournaments, et cetera, are not being played. 
Magpie Road lies in the middle of the 1,028,051 acres that make up the Little Missouri National Grasslands in Western North Dakota. Magpie Road lies about 200 miles north and west of the Standing Rock Reservation, where thousands of indigenous people and their allies have come together to protect the water, where sheriff's men and pipeline men and National Guardsmen have been donning their riot gear, where those men still wait, where they still hold tight to their riot gear. If a man wears his riot gear during prayer, will the sacred forsake him? If a man wears his riot gear to the holiday meal, how will he eat? If a man enters the bedroom in his riot gear, how will he make love to his wife? If a man wears his riot gear to tuck in his children, what will they dream? Magpie Road is part of the Bakken, a shale formation lying deep under the birds, the men in the truck, you, this road. The shale has been forming over millions of years through pressure through layers of sediment becoming silt. The silt becomes clay, which becomes shale. All of this is because of water. The Bakken is known as a marine shale, meaning once here, instead of endless grass, there lay endless water. Men drill down into the shale using water and chemicals to perform the act we call hydraulic fracturing or fracking. The water chemical mix is called brine, and millions of gallons of it must be disposed of as wastewater. In the Bakken in 2001, more than a thousand accidental releases of oil or wastewater were reported and many more go unreported. Grass won't grow after a brine spill, sometimes for decades. River fish die and are washed ashore to lie on the dead grass. There just off Magpie Road, robins sit on branches or peck the ground. A group of, riot, of robins is called a riot. This seems wrong at every level except the taxonomic. Robins are ordinary, everyday general public sorts of birds. They seem the least likely of all birds to riot. When the men in the truck make their second pass, they're on the road, the partridge sit their nests and the robins are not in formation. They are singular. No one riots but the colors. The truck, the truck revs and slows and revs and slows beside you. You have taken your last photograph of the grass, have moved yourself back to your car. The truck pulls itself close to your car, revving parallel. You are keeping your face still, starting the car. You've mislabeled your imaginary photograph. These men, they are not father and son. At close range, you can see there's not enough distance in age. One does sport camouflage, but the other a button-down shirt, complete with pipeline logo over the breast pocket. They are not bird hunters. This is not a sporting moment. The way time suspends indicates an off-season moment. The one in the button-down motions to you out the window with his handgun, and he smiles and says things that are incongruous with his smiling face. Two, the night before, in a nearby Fracklands town, you stand with your camera in your hotel room doorway. You left Standing Rock for the Bakken and the wood smoke from the water protector camps still clings to your hair. You perform your Fracklands travel protocol, photographing the room, the bedspread and desk, the bathroom. In your year and a half of research for your novel, of driving and talking to women in the Fracklands, you've performed this ritual, this protocol dozens of times. Women are bought and sold in these rooms. Women are last seen there. You upload the photos onto a website that helps find women who are trafficked, who've gone missing. The influx of men, of workers' bodies into Frackland towns brings an overflow of crime. In the Bakken at the height of the oil and gas boom, violent crime, for example, increased by 125%. North Dakota Attorney General Wade Steinahan called this increase in violent crimes disturbing and cited aggravated assaults, rapes, and human trafficking as chief concerns. In each place, each frack land, off each road, you wait until checkout to upload the photos of the rooms. In the year and a half of driving and talking and driving and talking, if you've learned nothing else, you've learned to wait because it is very, very difficult to sleep in a hotel room once you learn a woman's gone missing from it. 
three. In the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, a floor hand shuts the door to his hotel room, puts his body between the door and the woman holding fresh towels. A floor hand is responsible for the overall maintenance of a rig. The woman says to you that he says to her, I just want some company. He says it over and over into her ear, her hair, while he holds her down. She says it to you, your ear, your hair. She hates that word, she says, company. A floor hand is responsible for the overall maintenance of a rig. A floor hand is responsible. But who is responsible for and to this woman, her safety, her body, her memory? Who is responsible to and for the language, the words that will not take their leave? In a hotel in Texas, in the Wolf Camp Shale, you wake to the music of the trucks arriving and departing. This hotel is shiny tile and chrome bathrooms. It is a parking lot overfilled with trucks, with men from the fields who have an arrangement with management. An arrangement can mean flowers in a vase. An arrangement can mean these men pay for nothing, not even a room. In the morning, the parking lot is all trash can, beer bottles and used condoms and needles, the nighttime overflow. In a hotel in Texas, in the Permian Basin, you report to the front desk, R.E. the roughneck in the room above. You dial zero while he hits his wife, his girlfriend, the girl he has just bought. You dial zero while he throws her and picks her up and starts again. Or at least one floor down, this is the soundtrack. Upon his departure, the man uses his fist on every door down your hall. The sound is loud, but also is like knocking, like hello, like anybody home. You wonder if he went first to the floor above, but think not. Sound, like so many things, operates mostly through a downward trajectory. At a hotel where South Dakota and Wyoming meet, you're sure you've driven out of the Bakken, past its edge, far enough. The highway that night belongs to the deer, though they are not yet in season. All 40 or 50 of them stay roadside as you pass. You arrive at the hotel on caffeine and luck. The parking lot reveals the calculus of your mistake. Truck after truck after truck, and a hotel clerk outside transacting with a young roughneck. Their posture suggests a sheared cigarette or kiss or grope, something safetyed through vice or romance or lust, you'd take it. But here, the posture is all commerce, is about the positioning of the body close so money can change hands. You are in a place that's all commerce, where bodies never go out of season, where bodies are commerce only. When two more roughnecks stagger into your sightline, the hotel clerk and her partner are heading inside. She meets your eyes like a dare. The staggering man is drunk, the other holding him up while he zips his fly. This terminology, fly, comes from England, where it first referred to the flap on a tent, as in, tie down your tent fly against the high winds, as in, don't step on the partridge nest as you tie down your fly, as in, stake down your tent fly against the winter snows, against the rubber bullets, against the sight of the riot gear. The men sway across the lot, drunk loud, and one says to the other, hey, look at that and you are the only that there. When the other replies, no, I like the one in my room just fine, you are sorry and grateful for the one in an unequal measure. You cannot risk more roadside deer, and so despite all your wishes, you stay the night. A group of deer is called a herd, a group of roe deer, a bevy. There is a bevy of roe deer in the red forest near Chernobyl. The Bakken is not Chernobyl because this is America. The Bakken is not Chernobyl because the Bakken is not the site of an accident. The Bakken is not Chernobyl because the Bakken is no accident. Four, on Magpie Road, the ditch is shallow, but full of tall grass. With one hand, the button down man steers his truck closer to your car, and with the other, he waves the handgun. He continues, talking, talking, talking. The waving gesture is casual, like the fist knocking down the hotel hallway. Hello, anyone home, hello. Once on a gravel road, your father taught you to drive your way out of a worse ditch. 
When the truck reverses and then swerves forward as if to block you in, you take the ditch to the right. And when the truck slams to a stop and begins to reverse at a slant, taking the whole road, you cross the road to the far ditch, which is shallow, is like a small road made of grass, a road made for you. And you drive like that on the green and yellow grass until the truck has made its turn, is behind you. By then, you can see the highway and the truck is beside you on the dirt road and the truck turns right sharp across your path. So you brake, then veer left. You veer out onto the highway fast in the opposite direction. Left is the direction to Williston. So you drive to Williston and no one follows. At a big box store in Williston, a lot sign advertises overnight parking for RVs. You've heard about this, how girls are traded here. You had been heading here to see it and now you're seeing it. Mostly you're not seeing. You are in Williston for 38 minutes and you don't leave your car. You spend those 38 minutes driving around the question of violence, of proximity and approximation. How many close calls constitute a violence? How much brush can a body take before it becomes violence, before it makes violence, or before the body is remade, before it leaves all seasons, becomes something other than the body it was once, before it becomes a past tense body. Five, Q and A. Why were you there on the road? Because indigenous women are almost three times more likely than other women to be harassed, to be raped, to be sexually assaulted, to be called a that there because when the governor of North Dakota made an order to block entrance into the camps at Standing Rock and then rescinded it, he said the order was intended toward, quote, public safety. Because in his letter to the Standing Rock tribal chairman, the commander of the Army Corps of Engineers said he was genuinely concerned for the safety and well-being of both the members of your tribe and the general public located at these encampments. Because these statistics about trafficking, about assault, are knowledge considered common, but only if your body is not considered a general public body. Because you're a Meti woman. Because you and they and we misunderstand the danger at Standing Rock. The danger of this pipeline going in, there, or elsewhere, or everywhere. Because you and they and we misunderstand peaceful protesters as the ones bringing danger because you and they and we misunderstand the nature of danger altogether. Because each person in Flint, Michigan once rationed four cases of bottled water per week, now must buy their own bottled water or drink poisoned water or go without. Because you can see this future upriver or down, because everywhere is upriver or down. Because your first memory of water is of your father working to drown your mother because you are four or five and you need to use the bathroom, but instead find yourself backing up the bathroom doorway and down the hall where you sit on the rust colored shag because you wait for your father to quit trying to drown your mother. It seems crucial in the moment not to wet your pants. It seems crucial to hold the pieces of yourself together. If you make a mess on the carpet, if your father doesn't kill your mother, then she will have to clean the carpet. It seems crucial not to cause any trouble. So you sit, you wait, you hold yourself together because all roads used to lead back to that house and it is a measure of time and hard work that they no longer do because all roads lead to the body and through it because too many of us have these stories and these roads and these seasons because you carry theirs and they carry yours. And in this way, there is a measure of balance because you're still very good at holding yourself together because these times make necessary the causing of trouble, the naming of it. Because to the north and west of Magpie Road in the Cypress Hills of Southern Saskatchewan in 1873, when traders and wolf hunters killed more than 20 Assiniboan, mostly women and children in their homes, the Meti hid in those hills and lived. Because they lived, they carried the news. Because they lived, you carried the news. Because the message took place, because the massacre took place along the banks of a creek that is a tributary that feeds into the greater Missouri River. 
because these times and those times and all times are connected through land and bodies and water. What were you wearing there on the road? Not riot gear. Why didn't you call the police? See the water cannon on the bridge at Standing Rock. Listen to the sheriff's department men call it a water hose like this makes the act better. See also Birmingham, Alabama. See also Minneapolis, Minnesota. See the dog cages constructed outside the Morton County Sheriff's Department to hold, quote, overflow. See the overflow, the water protectors, Dakota and Lakota women and men in cages. See it all overflow. See the journalists arrested for trespass and worse. See the confiscated notebooks, the cameras they will never get back. See the new statistics, how eight to 10% of homicide victims in America are killed by police. See the woman struck by a tear gas canister. See how she will no longer be able to see through her right eye. See how, see the children whose grandmothers and grandfathers are hospitalized with hypothermia. See the elder who has a heart attack. See how science newly quantifies what some of us have long known, how historical and cultural trauma is lived in our bodies, is passed down generation to generation, how it lives in the body. See the fires the elders light to keep warm. See the water extinguish those fires. See the children seeing it. Why were you there by yourself? On a road like this, you're never alone. There's grass, there's sky, there's wind. See also the answer on historical and cultural trauma. See also Cypress Hills. See also the everyday Robins who are in formation now. See also their ordinary general public bodies in riot. What did you do after? You drove north and west and sat in rooms with friends old and new. You hiked and ate good meals and talked about art. On a hike one morning, you startled a rafter of turkeys. They flapped and squawked and strutted their necks. You laughed the laugh of one also startled. How they were in season did not come to mind till later. How your father hunted turkeys did not come to mind till later. You wrote things down. You began the work of stitching yourself back together. You did this on repeat until the parts hung together in some approximation of self. In Livingston, Montana, you made use of the car wash. You left the tall grass there. Further questions should be directed toward, proceed to the root. Upon arrival, pick up loose roadside threads. Use them to stitch shut the asking mouths. Six, at Standing Rock, the days pass in rhythm. You sort box upon box of donation blankets and clothes. You walk a group of school children from one camp to another so they can attend the school. The night before the first walk, it's rained hard and the dirt of the road has shifted to mud. The dirt or mud road runs alongside a field which sits alongside the Cannonball River, which sits alongside and empties into the Missouri. Over the field, a hawk rides a thermal practicing efficiency. There on the road in the mud, three Herefords block progress. The cow snorts to her calves, which are large enough to be ambulatory, young enough for the cow still to proper protection. She places her body between you, the threat, and her calves. She stamps her hooves into the mud and they stick in a way you imagine unsatisfactory. In that letter to the Standing Rock Tribal Chairman, the Army Corps commander wrote that the people must disperse from camp due to the concern for public safety, and because this land is leased to private persons for grazing and or haying purposes. A cow holds public hooves, whether stuck in mud or otherwise. A cow is not a concern to public safety, no matter the season. But what of these children? Are they considered public or private? If they don't graze or hay, if they cannot be leased, what is their value here on this road in this our America. That day there on the road, once the mother cow allows safe passage, you walk on. After school, but before the return walk, the children and you gather with hundreds to listen to the tribal chairman speak of peace, to sit with the elders to pray, to talk of peace. On this day, it's still fall. Winter will arrive with the Army Corps' words, no drilling under Lake Oahe, no pipeline under Lake Oahe. The oil company will counter, calling the pipeline vital, 
saying they fully expect to complete construction of the pipeline without any additional rerouting in and around Lake Oahe. The, wa the weather will counter with a blizzard. After the words and before the blizzard, there will be a celebration. The gathering of larks is called an exaltation. Even if it wasn't so, you like to think of larks there, like to think of their song, there with the people in the snow, there alongside the river. Back in the fall, you walk the children home from school, there on the road. You cross the highway, the bridge upon your return. This bridge lies due south of the backwater bridge of the water hoses or cannons. But this bridge, this day, holds a better view. The canoes have arrived from the Northwest tribes, the Salish tribes. They gather below the bridge on the water and cars slow alongside you to honk and wave. Through their windows, people offer real smiles. That night, under the stars, firelit, the women from the Salish tribes dance and sing. Though you've been to a hundred powwows easily, you've never seen this dance, never heard this song. You stand with your arms resting on the shoulders of the school children and the dancers, these women, move their arms in motions that do more than mimic water that conjure it. Their voices are calm and strong and they move through the gathering like quiet, like water, like something that will hold, something you can keep, even if only for this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna get to questions. Um, if you have a question, uh, feel free to put it either in the chat or um, in the Q&A. Um, I wanna say uh, thank you for writing this book. It's such a clear-eyed look at, at so many interesting uh, things and uh, such an interesting look at uh, violence and gun violence uh, in our culture. Um, but I wanted to ask, this is a, um, a, a memoir through essays, through personal essays. I wanted to ask how this book came together. Did it start from a particular essay? Uh, were there themes you wanted to build, build on or um, how did it come together? That's a good question. I think I wrote first the essays, um, all of the first handful in the collection, um, the first five, except for chapter two, Song Without Words, but the other four came pretty early. And so um, once I had written those, it started to seem to me like they had thematic threads. They they were all connected by gun violence. And, and I was pretty preoccupied at that point because the events from you know, the following chapters, like the shooting in Orlando at Pulse nightclub, um, shooting at the Christmas lighting uh, ceremony here in the town I live in now, that happened right as I was finishing the book. I mean, those sorts of things were sort of piling in, as they do if you, if you live all across the country. If you've moved around in America, there will be a shooting in the town you lived in. There will be a shooting in the town you do live in. I mean, it's just part of how we live now. And so, there were those sorts of instances of violence that was slightly outside, but also felt very inside because I knew people affected and I knew the places. And then there were the past um, incidents of domestic violence and um, my father owning so many guns that, you know, we would joke around that he had an arsenal, but of course that isn't really funny, you know, um, but you have to have humor where you can get it, I think. And so those sorts of factors all combined after I'd written maybe you know four or five essays to, to make me think that this was more than just discrete essays that yes, I was working on a book. Um, you mentioned the kind of inside and outside way of looking at violence. I, uh, it's so interesting throughout the book, uh, throughout your life in this book, uh, uh, we see kind of the violence that's everywhere. Um, and yet it's um, sort of invisible to us in a way. I, I think a, a lot of things that you talk about uh, in this book, um, you know, patriarchy, whiteness, um, uh, violence especially are everywhere, but, but invisible. I'm, I'm wondering how, as a kind of uh, writing to see, 
things to uh, get to the heart of that, how, how, what your process is into learning to see things that are kind of overlooked? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I started first as a journalist when I, I had a journalism scholarship as an undergraduate and I even did journalism work in high school. So my very first experiences as a writer were journalistic and I was really, I had very good teachers who really emphasized um, looking at the world in broad ways and always asking more questions, asking enough questions to maybe be irritating, you know? And so I think that's good training for being an essayist um, or a nonfiction writer in general. And I think you can turn them then at a certain point when you get enough age or enough confidence or whatever on yourself, right? On your own life, on your own family. And that's less comfortable sometimes, but I think it's just as necessary if you're gonna write a book, if one is gonna write a book about American violence, you have to have some stake in it, I feel like, or, or what, is, what is the point? Um, so I felt like I was very interested in all these other incidences, but I was also interested increasingly, um, you know, on about my own past and my own life and how, how those experiences shaped my view of the world. So I think it was, you know, one part experience, one part training, and probably the rest of it is just that I have more of a contrarian nature. If someone says a thing is so, I immediately think, are you sure, <laughs> you know? And you, can you elucidate that a little further? Um, you know, and I wanna know if they're really expert, if they really did experience it. I have all sorts of questions and I'm not saying that's necessarily always good and healthy and correct, but, but that is how my brain works. I'm always looking for the story underneath the story that someone says out loud. And so I think that, that the book shows that kind of a mind at work probably. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think of uh, many times you're uh, talking about um, how the language kind of conceals things, uh, even as it reveals other things. It, you're, you have this kind of motif of uh, the, the dictionary definition that kind of, you know, when you talk about an arrangement um, can be a, a grouping of flowers, but also how men pay for sex. Um, I also thinking about like distinctions that we make in our culture that maybe we shouldn't. Uh, there's sort of mental health and physical health, public violence and private violence, domestic violence. Um, uh, not sure my question here, but um, I'm wondering uh, uh, what your thoughts on, on how language uh, works in that way. I think language can work to get us to think differently about things we take as a given or as the status quo, or they can just sort of reify, right, the status quo. And that physical health or mental health, I think is a really good example. It's just health. Whenever my students come to me and say sort of sheepishly or email me and are very sort of, they seem shameful or apologetic about missing class for a therapy appointment, you know, they'll call it mental health. And I say, it's just your health. If you had a heart condition, would you be apologizing? You know, like, don't apologize. It's all health. I mean, I think that we do a disservice in so many areas for the way we want to carve things up and make them separate and segmented. And who benefits from that? I guess that's a question I'm always, I'm always mm -hmm. asked. Who benefits from the kinds of language that we have um, for our processes and procedures and our day-to-day you know, calling it campus carry or concealed carry seems so polite. You're just carrying a gun like you would carry your wallet, you know, no mm. problem. And that language is, the way that's become normalized is really quite interesting, I think, and telling. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Carol. Um, what do you do to take care of yourself uh, when you write about such painful events uh, that you know so well? That's a good question. I think at first I was just writing them down because it was harder not to write them down. Um, that now I have more structures and, and ways of working in place. So if I know I'm gonna write about something that happened that's painful, I think about other things that can be brought into the work and other things I can bring into my life while I'm writing it to balance that. So I try to get the painful parts out when I just write them and then to look at it as that's not the whole experience, but that's part of the experience. Like probably something funny happened during that time period, bring in the thing that's funny, 
maybe the landscape was beautiful. Part of the reason people always want to know about the birds, birds are really interesting and they're really beautiful generally, or they're, they're at least providing some color and some humor. They're funny, I think too, like robins are really funny the way they strut around and they're just so small. But, um, and so I'm thinking about then strategically now, always, not just when I write, but, but in day-to-day -day life, well, where you're not, you're not maybe, I tell myself sometimes you're not really maybe looking up or you're not looking down, like you're just staring in the middle distance. And, and so noticing those things more, um, and letting them in, letting them be influential, that really helps. And exercise, I, you know, trying to get enough exercise and be outdoors if possible, or swim or do something physical. Because I think when you write about something that was physically hard on your body, you have to physically rid it from your body. And that took me a while to figure out. Um, and it may not work that way for everybody, but I know a handful of other writers who I've heard say the same thing. So it's like, it's a physical process as well as a mental one. Mm. Uh, we have a question from Allison. In a culture founded in violence, genocide, enslavement, patriarchy, the rape of nature, what is your hope for what Cornell West calls a value shift? Yeah, I like that terminology, a value shift. That is what I'm advocating for in Carrie as far as our attitude about guns and our normalizing of guns. I'm calling for a value shift. So I like that language. Um, that said, you know, I don't know. I would love to be an arbiter of hope. And I so admire writers who bring more hope than they do skepticism. But I'm also not going to lie right now and say that I'm there. You know, um, I think I think because of climate crisis, by the time we get to a value shift, it might be too late. We're not very good at talking to each other. I live in the South and there's no place that exemplifies that better than a Southern college town, you know, where you have so many people who are at odds with each other, um, such a sharp division in culture and in thinking and in belief. And I think those divides can be ancillary to a value shift, right? I think that people can disagree on the political and still come together on um, things like climate change and, you know, sensible gun laws that help protect us. Uh, but that isn't happening right now. But it has happened in my lifetime I and mean, it probably depending on how old you are has happened in your lifetime right and so um you know for my daughter it feels like it's always been this way and so i like to tell her stories of like you know the before times your kid there were the 80s and the 90s where um you know it seemed they seem quaint by now the partisan politics of that time seem seem quaint to me so i'm hoping we can have a, a shift um that like what cornell West calls for, but but I don't know. I don't know if we can even get back to sort of 80s and 90s version of partisanism. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Is there something that surprised you about uh, either gun violence or how we talk about it and in the during the process of writing this book? The research, the some of the statistical research surprised me. Um, I think because the news so overemphasizes mass shootings and so overemphasizes, um, you know, crime in urban neighborhoods, um, the average. So, so I think then we assume sort of certain demographics about gun ownership. But the average, statistically speaking, the average gun owner in America makes more than ninety thousand a year and is white. And that the ninety thousand a year really surprised me because I think that a lot of people who are upper middle class or affluent and live in urban areas think that's not the profile. Plenty of those, plenty of people in that demographic um, also own guns. And that was, that was even surprising a little bit to me having grown up and mostly lived in rural America where I know everyone has a gun pretty much. Um, but, but that also, you know, yeah, affluent folks in the city all across the country um, also own guns was really interesting. Mm -hmm question from Nuria. Uh, what was the emotion or specific st story that triggered or inspired this book even accidentally, but on purpose? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so let's see which chapter it is. It's um, the invented histories of domestic birds, it's chapter three, um, plus city beautiful, which is chapter 12. So 
my nephew, um, a, a, gun, a gun violence incident happened to my nephew um, outside Boulder, Colorado, right around the same time frame as the shooting um, in Orlando at Pulse nightclub. And the convergence, I think, of those two things um, got me to thinking more about the connections. And then when Standing Rock happened too, and there was um, you know, violence by the sheriff's, Moulton County Sheriff's Department men, and, and you know, people from all over the country came, um, obviously, and all over the world came to be water protectors, but there was also law enforcement from all over the country. And I knew some folks who had to come who were, who were sort of leased out by their sheriff's departments, right? Some law enforcement guys from the upper Midwest, they didn't wanna go, oh, but that's your job and you're dispersed out. And some municipalities were really arguing about it and just sort of how these things were overlapping. The guy who did the shooting, Omar Mateen, who did the shooting um, and killed all those people in Orlando at the nightclub, for example, worked for G4S, which is the company that did security at Standing Rock. And so he got his weapons training while working for the same people who brought the dogs and the and the rubber bullets to Standing Rock. And when you start to see these overlaps, it's hard not to think there's a problem, a bigger sort of connectivity problem that we're not addressing by isolating and calling these things, you know, isolated incidents. So, so it was, I think, proximity of those three things. Um, but in particular, what happened to my nephew and then what happened in Orlando. Um, yeah, I was, I'm still pretty close with a lot of my students from those years and Pulse was their club and they would go there after workshop to hang out. And so I didn't go because I had a toddler at the time and but I heard a lot and, you know, they're my students, but, um, but I sure did hear a lot about it. And it was a safe space for many of my uh, Latino and queer students there in particular. And so that combined with what happened to my nephew. Yeah, those would be the, the ways the book really started. Hmm. How, how long did it take you to put uh, this book all together? I had written, I think, four or five essays um, before getting the contract. And then, you know, for fiction and poetry, of course, it's different. You have to have written a thing and really revised it and made it beautiful. And then maybe you can sell it or maybe someone will publish it. Um, for nonfiction, often, you know, books work off proposal and ch sample chapters. So I had these sample chapters and a proposal. And then it was like, well, we think we should be publishing it like tomorrow, essentially. And so hurry up and write the book. Um, so I, I think I had, I don't know, a little more than a year to finish it, a year and a half, maybe. And so then the rest of the writing had to be really serious and had to happen quickly. And mm. That was sometimes easy and not always easy. I was lucky I got a writing residency where I got to go to Marfa, Texas and hole up in a little house for a month. And a lot of the work got done thanks to the Landon Foundation um, and that Marfa residency really, you know, yeah, that was crucial. Um, but, but I wrote steadily while teaching full-time for Arkansas and part-time for Institute of American Indian Arts and their low res MFA. And, being a mom and you know you just you just make it happen if you're motivated and I felt like yeah it was a book you know plenty of people missed deadlines but I agreed with them that it was a book that should be you know that should be out that seems timely and we were still we were going into final proofs um when uh George Floyd was killed and I said well I didn't say I didn't ask I just took that weekend um, from like a Thursday or Friday through the Monday and, and weaved what happened to him into the rest of the book because I felt like that was crucial. Um, having lived up in the Twin Cities, my brother still lives up there in St. Paul. You know, I don't know. I just seemed crucial and mm -hmm. for those reasons and others. So, so we were still working on it at that level in June and then it was out in September. So wow. it, was, it was fast. Yeah, that all, even though it was a year and a half, that seemed really fast. Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly a, a timely book. Um, I have another question from Carol. Uh, did you work with different points of view before you chose the one in, in these essays? Most of the whole book is in first person singular. There's a uh, the little bit of second person is the first chapter. Um, and that essay was one of the first, and I tried to rewrite it into first person because I felt like now it's going to be in a book and it should have more cohesion or consistency. It just does not really work in first person. It breaks something. Um, 
and my editor agreed. And so and she, it wasn't her suggestion. It was just my thinking. And so we kept it in second person. There's some second person in smaller doses in other pieces. And then um, how to make a trafficked girl is a we collective um, essay. So, so there's some playing around with point of view. Um, I think if you're going to write something and have it be truly collective, sometimes the we is necessary. I also have written we collective short stories. I guess I just really like that point of view. I think it's good for writing about family. I think it's good for writing about culture or small towns in particular or neighborhoods, right? And so, um, so that one kind of really picked itself, its own point of view based on the nature of it. Um, the notion that making a girl who's gonna grow up to be trafficked is communal, that everybody's responsible. And so we seemed more responsible than you or I for that one. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Mm. Um, we only have time for one more, but I, I'm wondering if you, we could end by um, uh, talking about what it means to be Mati and uh, what it means to you. Sure. I mean, I'm Alberta Mati specifically, and so living in Arkansas, where most of the other native people I'm around are Cherokee, sometimes Choctaw or Osage, but um, large Cherokee nation presence here in Fayetteville. And so, you know, on the one hand, um, being Meti it, so far away from home is difficult because, well, you know, we have so many words for snow. In my culture, for example, we don't really get snow here <laughs> hardly ever. Um, you know, there's those sorts of what seem superficial differences, but are really kind of key and crucial differences. It's hard to maintain cultural ties and to keep um, feeling connected, but there are ways to do it. There's travel, there's, you know, re reaching out and meeting with people virtually, there's seeing family, I mean, all the regular ways. And so, so yeah, we manage, but, um, but location really does matter, I think, for Native people. And um, I'm always a little envious of the people who are actually from here, and they get to live here and work here, but that's not how, you know, tribal people, I mean, that's just not how it generally works in academia. So, um, but yeah, I think being Metis is an, an interesting identity because, you know, it's usually either French or Irish or Scots-Irish, Irish in my case, and, um, you know, whatever the closest um, tribe is to where the land was. And it's usually an intermarriage between trappers and traders and um, local women, you know, who were indigenous and that's, and then formed this distinct identity over time. And so the beadwork is beautiful, you know, that the, the the dances are beautiful. Um, and there's like, a, I just think there's an interesting mix between cultures that you don't necessarily find um, outside of Meti culture. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and thank you for, for uh, being here tonight. Uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I've enjoyed it too. And thanks so much for, for having me. And thanks to all of you for showing up and asking such good questions too. I appreciate them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, buy, buy the book. The link is in the chat. It's it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Um, I'm going to uh, put up our slide here. I'm going to thank our funders. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, this uh, event will be online on our website, wab.org, uh, and you can find more upcoming visiting author uh, events. Uh, and I want to say thank you for coming and have a great night.